I don't have any special knowledge, any particular insights. But I can surely understand why people of your age group are deeply concerned about such national issues as the war in Indochina, poverty in the midst of plenty, racism and racial tension, the plight of our cities, the destruction of our environment. These are great, important issues of American society, and I say again that people of your age group should be concerned about it. We devote our very best effort to making this a free and open campus where the important issues of the day can be discussed, can be debated. But if we are to maintain a free and open campus, we must have rules and regulations with appropriate accompanying penalties which deal with, dis with disruption and violence. Because no one has genuine freedom in an atmosphere in which disruption and violence are present. I sent all of you this summer a letter including the enclosed, enclosing the recently passed rules of student conduct, they apply to staff as well as students, passed by the Board of Regents. These rules are reasonable, I think, and with all due attention to the rights of a fair hearing for the students, we will attempt to enforce these rules fairly and forthrightly. Of the nation were addressed. Oh, well, it's kind of scary when you first get here. I came from California, and I, you know, I didn't know anybody here, but I really like it. It's a really beautiful campus, and everybody's really friendly. When you think about universities, do you think primarily about the strife and dissent that's been publicized? No, not really. I think the football games <laughs> and all the fun. I really, no, I don't think of the, the riots and everything like that. I really don't. Does the thought of campus unrest, student demonstrations frighten you a little bit? Not here. Not in names. Why not? Well, I think it's uh, too high class a school, maybe, or just it, uh, I think it appeals to a different type of student than the, the uh, people that, oh, liberate or whatever you want to say. No, not here at Iowa State. If I was going to some other college like back in the East, I think I would be, but I don't think I am here too much. It's really different here in Iowa from California, though, because there's, California, you see, you know, all the Mexicans and the blacks and everything. Here, it's mostly whites. You have the others, but they're not as well represented. Well, I would uh, always be optimistic about football at this time of the year and uh, because we haven't played anybody and we're having a, a lot of fun uh, trying to get ready for opening football game against Washington State. But I do think that if we're going to have a good football team, we have to improve uh, through our first four games so that we're in our league race. We're just about peaking. Uh, we won't uh, at this time have a great football team. Uh, at this time, we won't have a bad football team unless everybody in the league uh, is like the uh, Minnesota Vikings or the Kansas City Chiefs. If they're all like that, we'll have a bad team. But uh, I hope they're not that good. How do you relate this to the Big 8 Conference, which I understand is going to be difficult again this year? Well, that's what I'm relating it to. We have a lot of great football teams in this league, and you can start off with old Colorado, Nebraska, Missouri, uh, uh, Oklahoma, Kansas State, and I think that's what most of the pollsters have picked, and I wouldn't want to disagree with those people because they they see things, I think, in the right perspective. I, I'm i uh, somewhat uh, prejudiced, of course, toward our own football team and always believe in our players, but uh, you have to be realistic when you're picked seventh and sixth in the majority of the polls to realize, and you have to realize that uh, you're going to have to really play some good football to have a chance.
Primarily, we're interested in safety on the highways, not only of the people that are riding on buses, but also the trucks. But we hadn't really had an opportunity to take a look at these buses for some time, so uh, Secretary Volpe of the Department of Transportation said it's time we take a good, close, concentrated look. This is exactly what we're doing, taking a good, close, concentrated look. Why was Des Moines picked? Des Moines was picked because it was the route of movement for about 102 buses that would travel from Minnesota, Iowa, Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, into Chicago to a milk producers convention. What do you check for now on these buses? Primarily we're looking tonight for the things that might be likely to cause a breakdown or an accident, such as steering, brakes, exhaust systems, fatigue drivers, lights, this kind of thing. And uh, of course, my Uncle Joe was the only living relative that there is. And I do try to come at least once a year to see him or have him come to see me. Thank you. Let me just respond to that. Tell Mamie Eisenhower how proud we are of her and that I think all of us in the state of Iowa, in this country, and all the people around the world that know about the Eisenhowers, and there aren't many that don't, admire her and, of course, admired Ike very much. These are two people that people related to, and I can see why, and any of you who have had a chance to visit with Mamie Eisenhower while she's been here will understand why I say that she's really our kind of people. The state bird, the goldfinch, on an apple tree branch, and the base is walnut, and this was all carved by Frank Collins, and he served under General... You might uh, ask Mr. Collins a question or two, you'll find something rather interesting about the walnut, which was taken from the steps of the adjutant general's home. It was the stairway, and of course, when I started to work on it, it was covered with paint. After removal of paint, anything till he got...
Well, uh, probably about the same. Uh, we're in a position of uh, trying to uh, evaluate our ball club and come up with some ball players that will replace uh, some of the seniors we lost last year. But I think you're always doing this, and uh, I would say we're pretty optimistic about our ball club and feel like that uh, they'll come along pretty good. You lost nine, really nine great veterans or fine veterans who played a lot of football, three great ones, four great ones from defense in particular. Uh, might the defense be a little problem for you early? Well, this is true. Uh, we're concerned there because of the inexperience. Uh, some of the younger boys look good to us at the present time, but uh, there's no substitute for seniors who have all that playing experience. And uh, I think they'll be all right, though, as the season goes along. You have a couple of talented newcomers in the skill spots on offense, quarterback and fullback. Could you tell us a bit about them? Well, our quarterback at the present time is Tony Pounds, a transfer from a junior college. I think his main asset, he has a lot of poise and has a good arm, and he's a drop-back thrower. And at fullback, we have a young man up from the freshman team, James Williams, who was an outstanding boy here in Oklahoma high schools. And uh, he had a good spring training. Uh, he has good quickness and good speed, and we think he'll be a good one. Coach, the Big 8 Conference returns a lot of veterans in 1970. What is your overall evaluation, strong as usual? <laughs> I think the Big 8 will be as strong as usual. Probably more balanced this year than it was last year. I think that uh, the so-called uh, bottom of the list uh, could have a lot to do with uh, who wins the conference. Well, I hope that some of the suggestions that uh, the students will give today will be followed. And in that case, I think that something might possibly be done to establish some communication where we, we have had none before. However, I hope that the, the committee won't be used just for a political game or a political purpose of one or more individuals who form the committee who, or who are on the committee. Mm -hmm. Now, in your uh, presentation, you called for a legislative liaison. Now, what did you mean by that? Well, I, I believe that it's important today for students to actually know what's going on in the State House. This would be someone who could, could go to the students and say, perhaps this bill concerns you or this bill might concern you, and, and uh, it looks like perhaps this will pass. Maybe you'd like to go down and lobby for or against it, something like this. Also, there would be a youth coordinator uh, that is hired now by the governor, and we would hope that his job would be to actually communicate with the students and, and be on campus for them. Senator New, what do you expect to come out of this hearing with the students? Well, the legislators will become rather well aware of what, what it is that makes the students unhappy. That'll be the main thing that comes out of it. And then from there, we'll see. At this point, I don't know. Has anything new been revealed this morning to you? Yeah, I didn't uh, realize the uh, some of the issues that are local or, or that are just uh, in, in the state of Iowa, uh, sometimes it seems that they're, the main concern is the uh, war, but there are many things locally that they're unhappy about, and uh, this was brought home to me uh, rather forcefully in several occasions. Oh, there was some criticism of the legislature this morning. Uh, what was the reaction of some of the legislators at this criticism? Well, the, the, the students make the same mistake that we make when we judge them. We tend to judge them sometimes with a broad brush, and they're doing the same thing to the legislators. Uh, there's all shades of opinion in the legislature. There's the people that uh, in various issues agree with the students and those that disagree with them most of the time. And I think they're making a rather uh, uh, the same mistake they're accusing us of making in that they do judge us with this broad brush. Do you think this type of dialogue is going to help uh, solve some of the problems? I don't really know. I can't hurt anything. Uh, it has to either uh, maintain things neutrally or else it'll, it, it will help some. I, I can't help but think there will be some help. I don't think it's any panacea. I don't think there is any such thing. Well, I don't know. Uh, that's hard to tell just yet because we've been at it for such a short time that we haven't had too much appraisal. but. I, I really think that our team is going to be a, kind of a different nature team, of course, without uh, Bill Brundage, Bob Anderson, Bill Collins, those particular men. But I, I think also that uh, it will take on some characteristics that, are, that will make it an interesting team. And I do think that uh, as we mature, we might get to be as good a team as we were last year. Any basic changes in your offensive thinking from a year ago? 
Well, naturally, when you have an Anderson uh, vacate his throne, uh, you, you readjust a little bit, you put emphasis elsewhere, and I really believe that uh, we are a little better balanced offense uh, now uh, in that there will be more men functioning as a part of the, uh, the uh, primary uh, moving factors in the game. But overall, uh, our offense, of course, is still styled much the same way, the, the options and the uh, sprint out pass and then a little drop back pass too. How about your quarterback situation? Is this basically between Art and Bratton? Yes, uh, we've also got a boy named Ken Johnson, who is the sophomore coming up, and uh, all three of them uh, have uh, shown flashes of good ability uh, in this brief time, and uh, at the moment I think Bratton is definitely in the number one position, with Paul Arndt very close, uh, so I would assume that those two will make primary run at the job. A lot of coaches use the word competitive in terms of how their team might fit into Big 8 competition. I'm sure that's uh, more than hopeful, at least. Uh, going beyond that, though, how do you think Colorado might stack up in Big 8 competition this coming season? Well, I think we're a factor in the conference. Uh, I think our team is sound enough and uh, deep enough so that we can assume we will be a factor. I think, too, that uh, most teams in the conference are a factor. And by that, I mean uh, even teams that others might assume <clears throat> have the least likelihood of winning it, will they will defeat a couple of teams and keep those from winning it. So uh, I, I think it's a full A-team race. I think that we are a definite factor in the race, and I, uh, I think that we are healthy enough that if everything went just right for us, we could be one of the real prime contenders. Well, we think parts of it, of course, could be implemented immediately. Uh, there are parts of it which would take uh, several weeks uh, in terms of restructuring, et cetera, of present facilities and institutions that we're talking about housing the individuals in. Uh, I think that probably the total program, if adopted, and of course it isn't adopted yet, if adopted, uh, could be instituted no later than November 1st. Now, uh, does the Board of Supervisors have the funds available to pay for, like, uh, new jailers and uh, extra help? Well, I'm sure we'll say we'll have to take a long, jaundiced view at that, but I think the reality is that if we're going to make any kind of significant area in the area, in terms of restructuring the, the penal system, in terms of restructuring the jail system here in Polk County in order to protect our individual citizens, uh, we've got to find the money. We started this administration knowing that all of the taxes had already been raised knowing that the $112 million surplus had been spent and that we started out with virtually nothing. Yet, knowing that the taxes had been raised, it was my firm belief that we should not go back to the taxpayer and say, now we're going to raise your taxes again. So, that money which we had, the revenue that we had, and the spending over which I had some control, I decided we must take certain measures to live within our means. Now, how did we do it? First of all, it was my opinion that we could provide more economy in state government. I think I can report to you today that we have. And one of the best moves that we made was to invite private enterprise and private individuals, citizens of this state, to join with us in government to help us apply business techniques and tell us how we could do a better job and a more effective job with the amount of money that we had. We had some 60 businessmen, top business leaders of the state, help us. And they came forth with 593 recommendations. How we in government can save some $23 million a year. We have begun to implement what we can do on the executive level. And the legislature will have to implement some 60% or 30% of the recommendations with 60% of the savings. We provided more aid and more help and more finances for education than ever before in the history of this state. 60% increase in our area community colleges that I feel are so important. We provided a new tuition grant program so young people who want to go to one of our excellent private colleges can do so now. This helps the universities and colleges, and it also helps the taxpayers. We sent back 23% more money from the state level to aid local schools, an area where we have seen considerably more spending, the increased spending, which is part of the reason for the increase in property taxes, which is a matter of concern for all of us. 
There is a rumor abroad these days that Halloween isn't going to be observed in Iowa this year. When, at the end of this month, you taxpayers go down to, the sec to pay your second half property taxes, you will have seen all the goblins you'll want for one year. As you know, this administration, the Ray administration, ran on a no tax increase platform. No state taxes, that is. But this, in turn, triggered the most outrageous rise in local property taxes in Iowa's recent history. When no additional statewide revenues to spread the load equitably, the impact fell with cruel concentration on those who pay local property taxes, the most regressive and the most burdensome tax of all. The state of Iowa is drifting along this biennium on a pray-as-you-go basis. This means you run the government at half efficiency and pray there'll be enough money to squeeze by from month to month. In the meantime, this administration has given the state a do-nothing state government so far as initiative, progress, or building for the future is concerned. To make it worse, the governor has dipped into the road fund and other state reserves to defray reoccurring expenses and has, in effect, mortgaged the state's future. The plain fact of the matter are that there will have to be some sharing by the state of the rising burden of, financial, of financing education and other costs of government in Iowa. The legislature will need to consider all possible options that will bring the state increased revenues without increased taxes. You'll remember that we had a rock fest up in northeast Iowa, and the governor of the state of Iowa felt necessary to travel 200 miles up there to t talk to a group of dope-pushing hippies. Now, you see, he went there, he witnessed the felonies being committed, he even held the Iowa Highway Patrol in abeyance so they could not enforce the law, but the Iowa Code has very definite uh, 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 commitments about how uh, elected officials and police officers must act. They, the Iowa Code says they must uh, do all in their power to enforce the law and prevent the felony. Now, did the governor of Iowa do this? No, he wished them well. Now, to make matters worse, you see, Fulton and his Democrats even want to legalize marijuana in the state of Iowa, and so this thing can go on all through the state of Iowa without, without any interference whatever from government officials. Now, you see, friends, if I were the governor of Iowa, I'd guarantee you one thing, that I would do all in my power to slow down and to eliminate the drug pushers in Iowa, to jail them, and then to have the addicts treated, and so we could eliminate the problem instead of help promote it.